A Brief History of World War I Trench Construction Fighting trenches were usually four metres deep. Trenches were never straight but were dug in a zigzagging or stepped pattern. Later fighting trenches broke the line into fire bays connected by traverses. This meant that a soldier could never see more than 10 metres or so along the trench. Consequently, the entire trench could not be enfiladed if the enemy gained access at one point, or if a bomb or shell landed in a trench, the blast could not travel far. The banked earth on the lip of the trench facing the enemy was called the parapet and had a fire step. The embanked rear lip of the trench was called the parados. The parados protected the soldier's back from shells falling behind the trench. The sides of the trench were often riveted with sandbags, wooden frames and wire mesh. The floor of the trench was usually covered by wooden duck boards. In later designs, the floor might be raised on a wooden frame to provide a drainage channel underneath. Dugouts of varying degrees of comfort would be built in the rear of the support trench. British dugouts were usually 2.5 to 5 metres deep, whereas German dugouts were typically much deeper, usually a minimum of 4 metres deep, and sometimes dug three storeys down with concrete staircases to reach the upper levels. To allow a soldier to see out of the trench without exposing his head, a loophole could be built into the parapet. A loophole might simply be a gap in the sandbags, or it might be fitted with a steel plate. German snipers used armour-piercing rounds that allowed them to penetrate loopholes. Another means to see over the parapet was the trench periscope. In its simplest form, just a stick with two angled pieces of mirror at the top and bottom, a number of armies made use of the periscope rifle, which enabled soldiers to sniper at the enemy without exposing themselves over the parapet, although at the cost of reduced shooting accuracy. The device is most associated with Australian and New Zealand troops at Gallipoli, where the Turks held the high ground. There were three standard ways to dig a trench, entrenching, sapping and tunnelling. Entrenching, where a man would stand on the surface and dig downwards, was most efficient as it allowed a large digging party to dig the full length of the trench simultaneously. However, entrenching left the diggers exposed above ground and hence could only be carried out when free of observation, such as in a rear area or at night. Sapping involved extending the trench by digging away at the end face. The diggers were not exposed, but only one or two men could work on the trench at a time. Tunnelling was like sapping, except that a roof of soil was left in place while the trench line was established, and then removed when the trench was ready to be occupied. The guidelines for British tr trench construction stated that it would take 450 men six hours at night to complete 250 metres of frontline trench system. Thereafter, the trench would require constant maintenance to prevent deterioration caused by weather or shelling. The battlefield of Flanders presented numerous problems for the practice of trench warfare, especially for the Allied forces, mainly British and Canadians, who were often compelled to occupy the low ground. Heavy shelling quickly destroyed the network of ditches and water channels which had previously drained this low-lying area of Belgium. In most places, the water table was only a metre or so below the surface, meaning that any trench dug in the ground would quickly flood. Consequently, many trenches in Flanders were actually above ground and constructed from massive breastworks of sandbags filled with clay. Initially, both the parapet and paradise of the trench were built in this way, but a later technique was to dispense with the paradise for much of the trench line, thus exposing the rear of the trench to fire from the reserve line in case the front was breached.